Um, so I'm Ryan Lane. I work for Lyft as an infrastructure slash security engineer. Um, recently, I switched to being a security engineer at Lyft instead of an infrastructure engineer, but still do roughly the same thing, mostly security of infrastructure. <clears throat> So Lyft as an organization, as an engineering organization, is, um, its culture is set up in a specific way, which is if you build it, you run it. So um, we don't have a dedicated operations team. Instead, we have a very large number of small service teams that maintain their own set of infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> And really, they maintain their own services. So they maintain the infrastructure for it. They maintain the service itself. They maintain the code. They maintain the operations of it, which means that if they get paged, um, if the service pages, they're the ones that have to take care of the page. Um, they can escalate to another team if they need more help. But in general, they, they run their own services. Um, we have an internal team that was called uh, the DevOps team. It is actually now the infrastructure team since it more accurately reflects what we do. Um, and so we have a centralized team that is really there as a consulting team. Um, they don't do the operations. Instead, they will talk with the service teams about um, how they can build their services, how they can run their services, how um, <clears throat> the operational issues that affect them are, can become easier and such. And also, um, we do things like writing tooling um, orchestration tooling. We maintain uh, some of the salt stuff, but not the salt code. Specifically, things like state execution modules, orchestration modules, um, all of the tooling that they need to, to run things. Um, this also includes things like uh, running monitoring infrastructure and a few other things that teams use and rely on to ensure the operations of their service. Um, <clears throat> When we were building out our infrastructure a couple years ago and decided to switch over to Salt, we also um, had a number of constraints that come from the culture. Um, specifically, um, one of the biggest constraints that we had is that since we want our teams to manage their own infrastructure, that um, we wanted to empower them as much as possible. So the idea is that they should be able to maintain their own services code, which includes um, the code for SALT, whether it's orchestration or configuration management. But we also need to have some sanity and consistency across the services. So there's also a set of code that is shared across all of the services that is what we call base or shared. Um, <clears throat> Another constraint that we have is that everything must be code and that everything is treated as a deployment. So in this case, even our infrastructure is in code and it lives in both service and base depending on which portions of it is. The vast majority of this lives inside of the service. Um, and mostly, uh, the most important thing that we had when we were originally switching to Salt, because we were originally using Puppet and we decided to migrate to Salt, um, we were running Puppet in a um, master client mode. And we decided that when we were going to switch to Salt or something else, that um, our main constraint would be that we would have no masters. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, the most important reason is that we had gone through a process when we were using Puppet where um, we were originally maintaining individual Amazon instances in EC2 that um, ran sets of code for different types of clusters and such. But for every single node that we needed, we had to create another node. It was a very manual process. And so we ended up switching to autoscale groups. And one of the issues with autoscale groups is that they can scale up and they can scale down. And you don't have any real um, ability to control things like the instance's name. They have instance IDs, and that's basically all you get. Um, and this becomes a very serious problem when you're looking at masters, because you have to have some way for the master to trust the minion. So um, the biggest, biggest constraint here is that we wanted this to work with autoscale groups flawlessly. We wanted to ensure that when a node came up, that it didn't have to wait for a master um, we also wanted some of the speed benefits that come with not having a master, meaning like you can 10x the number of nodes that you have, and you don't have to worry about a master being overloaded, you don't have to worry about it slowing down, et cetera. 
Um, we also have uh, another constraint in that we have multiple environments. Um, previously, we had more environments than just this, these three, but we've consolidated down to just production staging and development. Um, but the idea is we need to ensure that the code works across all of these properly. <clears throat> so when looking at an infrastructure, um, we can start off with a very basic service in Amazon. And for this basic service, you'll have, um, let's say for instance, a load balancer that has a security group and an auto scale group that's running your service that also has a security group. And then maybe behind that, the state that you're writing into is DynamoDB. And for users to access this, you have a Route 53 entry that makes it possible for them to resolve your domain. So this is a very basic service. Um, and if we start looking at um, as the service grows, your service centers want to add more things into it. And so you start getting a little more complex. So they ran their service and they decided, well, just having a web process is enough. We also need some workers that do some, uh, that do some things that occur maybe on a cron or daemon processes that do continuous actions that are not web driven. And so you add another auto scaling group. And for this, it uses SQS to do its asynchronous uh, job processing. And then you also want to share some state between the nodes. So you add an elastic cache, and that has a security group, and the other thing has a security group. And one of the things behind this is that um, you're going to add more things in as well. So it's not just the infrastructure in Amazon that you need to think about um, that runs the service, but it's all of the infrastructure that supports it as well. So for instance, you want a page for the service, so you need pager duty. You need um, maybe to page for things that, are only, that can only come out of Amazon, so you page from CloudWatch alarms. And maybe you have some Splunk alarms for your logging, and you need a Splunk dashboard, and you need a Grafana dashboard, and all of these things are stuff that your developers have to set up for every single service that they're gonna run. <clears throat> And when you really look at this, this is just a single environment. When you start adding in multiple environments, like the complexity starts becoming really, really bad. So the biggest issue here is thinking about consistency because you need all of these environments to look exactly the same. And especially when you consider this is just a single service and you start adding in more services, this is really what things start looking at. This is actually just a small number of services. This is like maybe, 12 services or something like this. So if you start getting to like 100 services, your infrastructure is going to look really rough. <clears throat> so if we look at how to maintain these things, we have all of the stuff that's on the outside, and then we have all the stuff that's in the inside. So the outside stuff is things like your infrastructure, the autoscale group, the load balancers, um, the thing that holds state like DynamoDB or something along those lines, Ref 53 entries, all of the other external things like uh, Grafana, Splunk, et cetera. <clears throat> and so we want to manage that as code, and we also want to manage what comes up on the instances. And for those two things, we have um, a general repo layout. Um, so <clears throat> we have orchestration code, and we have configuration management code. And this is stuff that actually lives inside of a services repository directly. Um, this lives both there and it lives in another location. But the idea is that <clears throat> developers can go into the orchestration directory inside of their repo and they can modify their state's pillars and add custom modules. And similarly, in configura configuration management, they can do the same. And it's just where the code actually um, operates at, uh, the layer or the, yeah, the layer that it operates, whether it's outside of the instance or inside of the instance. Um, also, we have very explicit naming conventions for our services. So if we look at, at an Amazon instance, we have this naming convention for resources, and we can look at this uh, at, at a specific instance to kind of break this down to what it is. And the idea is that we have a cluster, which is an auto scale group, and it has a service name, which is example. The service instance, which we uh, use instead of environment, because environment is overloaded in every configuration management system and is bound to cause you problems, um, which is, in this case, is production. Then we have a region, which is ID. It's mapped from the airport code that's nearest to whatever the data center is. 
Um, and then we have a service node, which is the instance ID. And, and these names seem very long. How did the load balancers have a 3 key character limit? Right. So this is specifically just an instance ID. Just the instance ID. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'll show you, I'll show you the, uh, how we do things for the load balancer and the rest of the resources soon. Um, so we actually take these and we break them down into grains. And this allows us to use these grains in both the configuration management but also the orchestration. So looking at an entire cluster, we take this, um, this naming convention and we spread it out to every single thing that we have in Amazon. So for instance, the cluster name is example production ID. Its ELB name is example production ID. Um, the auto scale group name is the same thing. The launch configuration is the same thing. The IAM rules is the same thing. Each one of the in individual instances is the cluster name with um, the instance ID appended. The SQS queue is the cluster name with the name of the queue appended, et cetera. And so the idea behind this is that it allows us to kind of avoid doing any type of service discovery, um, which when looking at master lists is important. Um, <clears throat> For the orchestration itself, we just use salt states. And the idea behind this is we don't actually have a master, so we have to run this code from somewhere. The general idea is that by making everything salt states, um, all we have to do is, any, we can have this code anywhere, and we can just run it. We can run it from a laptop, we can run it from Jenkins, et cetera. Um, if our Jenkins server dies, we can bring up another Jenkins server, or if they're totally screwed, we've like ruined everything, we can run it from our laptops. Um, the nice thing is it is completely decentralized from every other cluster that's there. So this is everything that runs from the outside, and this is also what brings up the individual hosts. So in this specific example, um, we're creating an IAM role in Amazon. Um, this just go th goes through uh, the IAM role that's going to live on our uh, autoscale group, and it defines the policy of what that autoscale group is allowed to do. Then we also define the security group that goes along with it that says these are uh, the security group rules that we're going to then attach to an ELB. The ELB itself has um, a set of policy. And one of the things to notice in here, in, in here is that we're using grains just like we would be uh, using in configuration management. And these grains are broken down by uh, things like the cluster name. and. The cluster name is the combination of all of these things, and the service, it's the combination of the service name, the service instance, and the region. And uh, so we can use the individual things from this as well <coughs> to define the ELB. And one of the, the things with all of this orchestration code is that um, everything is referencing other things by name for the most part. So instead of having to reference an ELB by its ELB ID or a security group by its security group ID, um, we reference it by the name of those things and it automatically looks up those things as, as they are created. Uh, here's an example of creating uh, CloudWatch for the ELB. So one of the things to notice here is that um, we're creating an ELB and then here we're going to apply some alarms to the ELB. One of the things to notice about this ELB is that um, we have, um, it doesn't really um, have any information about the alarms. Basically, it just defines the ELB. One of the nice things about most of the orchestration states for the AWS code is that it does some magical things. Um, it will look information up from the pillars to define extra things that come on them. So for instance, in here we have the uh, ELB alarms. If any single service owner creates an ELB, it will automatically get alarms applied to it. And this is stuff that lives inside of the shared directories, which is base. <clears throat> Similarly, we have uh, states for autoscale groups and launch configuration. And the basic idea is um, this is gonna, going to create an autoscale group. And one of, the also, uh, one of the things that you have to deal with in uh, Amazon with autoscale groups is that you also have a launch configuration that is associated with the autoscale group. Um, the launch configurations can only be created or destroyed, um, which is really, really annoying. 
So what this does is it will create the auto scale group and it will have the auto scale group automatically manage the launch configuration. So if you make a change to the launch configuration in this state, it will see that you've changed it because it takes a hash of the configuration and then it will look up the launch configuration that you have defined in Amazon. It will see if uh, it, we, keep the name of the, uh, we keep the hash in the name of the auto scale, um, of the launch configuration. If it differs, we create a new launch configuration, we attach it to the auto scale group, and then we delete the old one. <coughs> of course, we also have the ability to attach scaling policies to auto scale groups so they can scale up and scale down. Um, <coughs> in this particular configuration, we say that if the, uh, this is actually just adding the scale up and scale down policy saying we're going to remove five um, over a period and we're gonna add 15 over a different period. Um, and then we have policies that can live in pillars for the autoscale groups that define the actual alarms that will trigger these things. So for instance, in this configuration, if anyone creates, if any service owner creates an autoscale group, and the minimum size and the maximum size of the autoscaling group do not match, then these alarms will trigger and it will cause um, the scaling uh, groups to either increase in size or decrease in size based on the policies that we've had assigned. So the nice thing is people just have to say, I want an autoscale group and I want it to be within these sizes and they automatically get a policy that's associated with their autoscale group. Similarly, we have orchestration for Splunk alarms. Um, just basically just um, define based on a log search how it should uh, alert if there are certain things that come up in the logs. Um, we also have orchestration for Grafana. So for instance, um, we have uh, one of the things that we do is that we have a very consistent set of languages. We do mostly Python, and we have uh, some Go services now, and we have one deprecated PHP service, but we have a very large number of services. So we have uh, a template repo where you can generate new services, and it gets a lot of this code automatically. So one of the things that it also gets is things like Grafana dashboards alerts that are set up by default. And the nice thing about this is that when you generate your service and you launch it, you automatically get dashboards that are generated for your service. Um, <clears throat> and you get all the alarms, you get your pager duty set up, et cetera. And in this case, um, this is an example of a dashboard that's auto-generated for a new service. And since it's all standardized, it also has information automatically applied for ELB, auto scale groups, et cetera. This is one of the things of doing uh, proper uh, very consistent naming schemes. Um, so we didn't add all of these modules, but we did add a majority of these modules. And um, so we maintain the majority of the AWS orchestration code that's in Salt Snack right now. Um, it's actually relatively extensive. It's probably more, ex uh, more extensive or comparable to what Terraform currently has. Um, and in some cases, it does things that are a lot more magical than what Terraform currently does. Um, the nice thing about all of these is they're implemented as state and execution modules. So um, you can do all of this as infrastructure as code. You can run it masterless, so you can run it from the master. Um, of course, I prefer masterless. Um, <clears throat> but the general idea is that you can run it from anywhere. And I can show you how we do this. We actually use a wrapper script because um, in general, running salt um, there's a pretty decent amount of configuration that's required if you want to run it as a non-root user um, from a place where it's not installed through apt or something along those lines. So um, we have a wrapper script that basically just uh, takes a set of predefined configuration, um, puts it into a temp directory, and then um, adds, uh, <coughs> adds some configuration and some CLI flags that will uh, tell it to use a different root directory to run as a non-root user, um, and a bunch of other like kind of basic setup, for instance, um, locals true to make it local mode, um, and it tells it where to find its code. Um, then we also have uh, the way that we actually run this, 
and this is specifically for the orchestration. So we pass in environment variables, and these environment variables get turned into grains. And this is how we have um, the configuration management match the orchestration. So the grains in both places are the same because when we run the orchestration, we pass an environment variable saying, this is how we're gonna run uh, the orchestration. Specifically, it's gonna be for the example service where the service instance is gonna be production, region is uh, assumed to be a specific region unless you override it. In this case, the region is assumed to be IID. Um, and then we tell it what code to actually run. So mostly it's just running a salt, uh, the, it's running the salt wrapper which is calling salt call and then telling it to run state.sls specifically against the example sls file inside of the path that's set up. So if we look at config management, um, a lot of this is actually generally the same. So um, we have the salt configuration that is set up in a very similar way. Um, one of the things that we do is that we always run with fail hard. And the reason for this is since we're using autoscale groups, we never want failures, ever. And if we have a failure, it should fail. It should fail hard and it should fail immediately. It should fail deployments. It should cause the node to not come up. Um, and it should send us alerts. We never want the, the node to run salt multiple times and then have it come into a consistent state that way. It always needs to run correctly the first time. So uh, we run with fail hard true. Um, and we specify the file routes, the pillar routes, and the module directories. And specifically, we have um, two different locations this salt code comes from. One is the service itself, and then another one that, that is the base, which is the common shared code. And this is true for the file routes, the pillars, and the modules. That way, um, the service owners have the ability to override anything that's in base including um, individual salt modules that maybe their service needs to override temporarily. <clears throat> uh, we also have a number of external pillars. I will go into this later. Um, this is used for things like secret management and a few other things. Um, since we're not running a master, obviously we can't use pillars from a master, so we have to deal with that. Um, looking at the top files, they're generally very simple. Um, for the pillars, we load the base pillars and we load the services pillars that are specific to the entire service. And then we have overrides if they exist. And so in this case, we're loading pillars based on grains, which in master minion would be something you should not do because it's insecure. But in masterless, it doesn't matter because all of your code already lives in the system anyway. So um, your minion isn't gonna get extra code by changing its grains or faking its grains, which you can do in master minion mode. Because in master minion mode, if you restrict the access to your pillars based on a grain, every minion can define their grains as whatever they want and send it to the master. So if you're doing that, any minion can then change the grain and then get pillars from another service. In this case, since we're always deploying the code to the systems and the pillars live on the system, we don't have to worry about that. So we can use grains however we want. So in this case, we are going to additionally add in um, grains based on the service group, which is a combination of service name and service instance. So in this case, example dash production. And so if a pillar file named uh, example dash production .sls exists, it will load it. Otherwise, if it doesn't exist, we're gonna use the ignore missing feature, which we added so that it won't fail. <coughs> The state uh, top file is actually very simple. It just loads base and then it loads the service. And then from there, um, the service itself, each one of the individual services just does, it so it's includes inside of its own file. This way, when we're doing copies uh, from the service template into a new service, everything looks exactly the same. We don't have to worry about changing those two files. They never have to be changed for any service. They're always exactly the same for every single service. So one of the nice things about having config management and orchestration use the exact same grains is what I mentioned earlier about not having to do service discovery. So when this runs, um, you can have um, your configuration management, for instance, set up references to its Dynamo tables or set up references to its Mongo uh, databases and such by using things like the cluster name. So in this example, we're going to set up um, development to point at a specific Dynamo table and 
we know the name of the table, it's the name of the cluster, and in this case, in this case we maybe have multiple Dynamo tables that we've uh, appended so the actual name of uh, the table that's specific. But in this case, we can have um, development be example-development-id-example table. In staging, it would be example-staging-id-example table, and in production, it would be the same, but for production. Um, and the idea is, instead of having to run something like etcd or zookeeper that stores information and state about our clusters, we just reference it by name. <laughs> so um, one of the things about, about doing uh, masterless is that instead of having a master that, uh, that can be used and connect to that will handle your deployments, you have to have some mechanism of doing your deployments yourself. So for us, our deployment process follows a normal Git style workflow. Um, and specifically, every single thing that we do is a deployment, whether it's an orchestration change, it's a code change, um, <clears throat> whether it's configuration management um, or the actual services code, it's all the exact same. It goes through the exact same process. So in this process, the developer will make a feature branch in GitHub. They will get a review from someone, uh, ideally a plus one, and passing tests. And then they will merge their PR. Um, <clears throat> then they will go to Jenkins to a pipeline for their service, and they will start a deployment. That's all of the stuff that generally happens from the user's point of view. After that, it's um, the stuff on the left is orchestration, and the stuff on the right is configuration management. So um, from the orchestration point of view, Jenkins will generate an artifact, a tarball artifact from the service, which also includes things like uh, frozen virtual environments and such. Um, it turns that into a tarball, it pushes it into S3, and it releases it to the environment. So in our case, we have um, files in S3, and these files are in prefixes in an S3 bucket that are well known to the service, generally based on their service's name. And inside of the file, uh, they'll have, or sorry, we'll have a number of files that will be something along the lines of release.staging, release.production, um, deployed artifacts.staging, deployed artifacts.production. And inside of these, they just have git jobs. And <clears throat> When, so when we release something to an environment, we're just updating the file to change the SHA that's inside of it, saying that for staging, the SHA that you should be running is this thing. Um, here's the, and then we'll also update the other file that says these are the five or 10 Git SHAs that you should have on the box, so that in the case of us needing to revert a change, it already has the code on the box, it doesn't need it to re-download it and things like that. Um, <clears throat> then the last step in the process is to run orchestration. And the orchestration is ensuring that like the autoscale group is set up, the launch configuration is right, the security group's there, et cetera. And this runs on every single deployment. <clears throat> on the right-hand side, after all of the orchestration has occurred, then we have a cron that runs on every host that runs once a minute. And what it does is it is what we call pull deploy. It checks in S3, it looks at the files that match its service and environment, and it says, is this different than the state that I currently have in the system? And we have this um, state in the system that is this idea of current and next, where current is the current state of the system. It has whatever is currently deployed, that's the last successful deploy of the system, um, that has the services code, and <clears throat> then we have the next state of the system. Both of these are just symlinks, and these symlinks point to uh, git shots. So in the case of um, a new deployment, it'll see I needed to change the state of the system. So it updates the, sh the, uh, the link of the next uh, link to point at the new shot. And salt is always pointing at next. And the idea is <clears throat> after it does this, it'll run some pre-deployment hooks which can be custom per um, service. And then the next thing that it does is it'll run salt. If salt fails, it just continuously tries to rerun. 
It will always continuously fail because the same exact state will always happen. and It'll fail hard at that point in time. Otherwise, if it succeeds, it then switches the current link um, to point at the same thing that the next link is pointing at. And then it will run some post-deployment hooks. Um, specifically, in this case, that would be things like restarting the service that's supposed to be running in the box. Um, and the service that's supposed to be running in the box, it's always pointing at the current link. So the idea is, if you have a failed deployment, your service doesn't get restarted. It continues to point at the old state of the system. If it succeeds, you change the links to point at the new code, and you restart your services, and then your, ser your service then um, then your service uh, is running the new state of the code. And the last thing that occurs is you report the status. In our case, we were reporting back to a discovery service. We were previously using etcd, but um, we rewrote into our own custom thing that hopefully we'll open source at some point in time that's based on DynamoDB. Um, so from the user's point of view, um, all of this looks relatively complex, but this is all the end user actually sees. They have a Jenkins pipeline, and for the pipeline, they have the ability to run the job, and then the job, um, when they start running it, shows as yellow, and shows that it is working, and it shows a status bar. And then it either comes back as green, you're good, it finished that, story, that stage of the deployment, or it comes back as red. Something went wrong, you need to check the output, you need to look at your logs, you need to see why your service failed to deploy. Um, and this is specifically the reason that we do fail hard, is so that if they have messed up something in their salt states, they will get a failed deployment. And they will have to fix their deployment, and then they either need to revert, or they need to roll forward. Um, we actually have a process where they're supposed to roll back immediately. And that's just going back to the last successful state and clicking deploy, which changes the SHA, goes back through a deployment process. <clears throat> but the general idea is that they go through um, they go through each individual stage, and in this case, it goes to staging first, make sure that that works properly, then they go to a canary node, and one of the grains that we set on some of the nodes, we will create an autoscale group canary um, that has exactly one node, and it gets a grain that marks it as a canary, so it knows that it needs to do a deployment that's specific to canaries. But the general idea is we go from staging, we go to canary, which takes live traffic, um, they let it bake on canary for a while, and then they go to production. <clears throat> so of course there's uh, some issues running masterless. Um, one of the issues is that you basically strip all of the really nice features of Salt away. Um, specifically, you don't have remote execution anymore, um, which means that you need to do it through something like maybe Salt SSH, which doesn't work very well with Amazon because they don't even have a roster for it. Um, or you use something like fab, or you use some other thing to do remote execution when you need to do it. In our specific case, we actually don't do remote execution very often. We use fab, but um, it's pretty rare when we need to do it, because for the most part, we can just do a deployment, and it works the same way. Um, including if we need to change every system, we can do a deployment of our base, which will affect every single system. Uh, so you're saying your So yes and no. Um, it's not immutable. We don't destroy the infrastructure and bring it back up. Salt will rerun. Um, we deploy new code. It reruns Salt every time. So th the state of a system can change. We've tried to make it as immutable as possible um, by doing this next current thing. But it's not really guaranteed. There's a possibility that you've added a Salt state that will um, add something. And then if you go to revert, it doesn't remove it unless you write your code very defensively. Um, and I should, I should have repeated the question, but it was, do we, uh, is our infrastructure immutable? Um, so yeah, and we've actually had problems with this. We've had some outages that are related to this, and I'll go into later like how we're changing some of our infrastructure to, uh, to get rid of this issue. Um, another issue is vu uh, vulnerability remediation. Um, this is similar to remote execution. It's very easy to, uh, to patch large sets of systems if you can do remote execution to them because you can just run a command that says every one update. Um, when you have to do this through salt states, it's kind of a pain in the ass because say for instance, you need to ensure a, a specific version of 
uh, a package is there, at least in Ubuntu, your only options are to use the latest, which is a terrible idea, um, especially because it will force an app get upgrade, uh, an app get update every single time Salt runs, which is incredibly slow and also eats a lot of CPU. Um, or you need a lock to a specific version, which also means if you leave it there for a long period of time, that that version may disappear, and then your salt start, states start breaking, and people don't really know why. Um, this is actually a generally hard problem that's uh, not totally sure how to solve. Um, then there's also vulnerability tracking. Um, one of the nice things about having remote execution and salt um, is that you can have jobs that run on your salt master that check the state of all of your systems to see if they've been patched for things or if they meet um, or if they have all if they have resolved all of the CVEs. For a lot of these things, you can um, at least for the tracking, there's alternatives that you can do instead of having something that runs in a master. You can if you're already doing some form of discovery where you're you're reporting status back during your deployments or things like that, you can also report back on things like CVEs and such. Um, and there's also service discovery. So um, you get a bit of service discovery with a master, and when you have no master, now you have to re-implement this yourself. Um, I actually don't see that one as a large issue because I don't think Salt's service discovery is actually very good, and I think most people that are doing anything are probably using etcd or Zookeeper or something along those lines for service discovery anyway. Um, another issue with masterless is secret management. Um, so with a master, you at least get some form of secret management where you can define stuff in pillars and then you can restrict sets of pillars to sets of hosts. Um, when you're running masterless, you don't have this anymore because you have to deploy all of the code to every one of your systems. And then you have to consider how am I going to get a set of secrets out to a set of servers and ensure that only those set of servers have these secrets. Um, in our specific case, we wrote a secret management system. Um, it's called Covenant. It's open sourced. Um, it is specific to AWS. If you are running and you're only in AWS, then you should consider using this. It's great. Um, but it's similar to things like Vault or KeyWiz. Um, the general idea here is that um, an individual cluster and the nodes in the cluster can, through external pillars, get uh, secrets that are specific to them that then can live on the host. This is actually one case where masterless is better than master minion because you can't use vault or uh, confidant or keywiz or any of these systems with master minion, at least in a way that's generally secure or good. Um, and that's specifically because external pillars or just pillars in general when you're using master minion are all live on the master. And the master is assumed to have access to all of the pillars and then the minions get access to a subset of those pillars. Whereas in this case, your minion is actually acting like a master. So um, when the minion goes to get its external pillar values, it's actually just getting it for itself. So in this case, it's already getting something scoped. It's talking directly to the secret management system instead of talking to a master that's talking to a secret management system. Um, and in fact, I don't even think it's possible right now for Salt to uh, work with Vault or Confidant in master minion do uh, to the way that it's implemented. I have a bug open for this that hasn't been fixed yet, but um, in my case, I don't really care because I'm doing masterless anyway. Um, there's uh, a few masterless wins, of course. Um, one is that you don't have to do any node registration. You don't have to worry about key management at all. Um, because your nodes come up in an auto-scaling group and they download their code from S3 and they just run. Um, which also means that you have less external dependencies and less possibility of, um, of things failing that will cause you to fail to scale. So for instance, uh, you don't have to worry about scaling your master. So if, for, in if for instance, you have uh, a spike in traffic and now an autoscale group grows from 10 nodes to 100 nodes, um, you don't have to worry about your master not being able to scale with that and failing and then causing all of your nodes to fail and then you having an outage. Um, you also don't have to worry about master HA, which in Salt, at least currently, I think in the next version they're making this better from what I've been told, but at least in previous versions, getting master HA to work is very, very difficult um, and generally doesn't work. And lastly, as I mentioned, secret management. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things that, um, that we do 
that's a bit weird currently is that um, we, in, for development and test and CI, we're using uh, Docker. Um, and this is specifically so that we can test a number of services together in a single box. So in development, it will be user's laptop. It'll run a vagrant virtual machine. And inside of that, we'll have Docker. And then we actually build the Docker containers using salt, or the images. So um, each one of the images is based on the Fusion base image uh, image that you can download from the Docker registry. And this runs uh, a fat container. So at least currently, we're not going with a thin container model. And um, each one of these services runs basically as a full virtual machine, except their containers. And <clears throat> through this, we have all of these linked in some way that are also accessible from the developer's laptop. So we can essentially run all of Lyft on a laptop. <clears throat> We also have the same thing in AWS. And on this, we have an AWS instance that runs Docker that is running the same set of containers. Um, so as I mentioned, um, we are running Docker plus salt using the Fusion base image. We have a Lyft base image that everything is based off of. And then to generate the service images, we don't use Docker files at all. Everything is salt code. And the way this works is that instead of doing a Docker build to build the images, we do a Docker run to run a container, which will run salt. And then when that finishes, we do a Docker commit, which gives us back an image. Um, those get pushed into the Docker registry. And then past that, people get to pull the images and run them like they would be normal Docker built images. Um, we use tags for versioning of the individual containers. <coughs> So this is actually not what we want to do in the future. Um, in the future, we're actually uh, already moving to this. Um, previously, we were doing Docker for development and CI. And um, we had some issues in production where running salt on instances that are long lived is not necessarily immutable. And this has caused us some issues where um, we would push something out through base. Um, Maybe someone didn't canary it well enough. And um, then they go out to prod, and then every single service breaks at the same time. And they've done it in such a way to where um, something they did added something, and then they go to revert, and it doesn't get removed. And then in this situation, then we have to rebuild the entire fleet. Um, we have actually done that. <laughs> it's not fun. But um, thankfully, due to the way that we do master, uh, we do that we do masterless, rebuilding the entire fleet in, in our situation is um, telling Amazon, I want you to remove or detach every instance from every single auto scale group, which then Amazon says um, it detaches them, and then it notices that none of their auto scale groups have any instances in them, which will cause Amazon to rebuild every single one of the instances, basically doubling the number of instances you're running. When those come up and register, then you can delete the old ones. <clears throat> um, so due to this fact, um, we have, we're starting to move away from doing uh, salt for configuration management. Instead of doing uh, salt for configuration management on long-lived hosts, we are doing uh, Docker images that are the same between development, staging, and production. They all use the exact same image. Um, and Salt only manages the hosts. And specifically, what it's managing in the hosts is things like users, uh, security patches, um, but none of the service code and none of the stuff that really is crucial for the system to run is, is being managed by Salt on the host. Instead, those are being run. Um, those are being run inside of uh, Docker containers that are downloaded from images from a registry. Um, <clears throat> so in this specific case where Salt is managing the host, we're also doing something slightly weird there. Um, we put the, the centralized code that's supposed to be on every host into a repo. We actually build a Docker image from that. That gets pushed out to the hosts. Um, when the container runs on the host after it's downloaded that image, it writes salt SLS code out into a, um, into a volume mount and adds some touch files. We have a cron that runs that checks every once in a while whether the, uh, the touch files exist. If they do, it runs salt against the code that's on the file system. Um, 
And then otherwise, if the touch files don't exist, it just exits. So um, we're even pushing out the salt code through Docker images uh, for managing the host itself. Um, <clears throat> So if we look at how things change here, instead of um, salt managing the Docker containers, the Docker files themselves are being, uh, the Docker images are being maintained by Docker files. We have Docker containers that run inside of a virtual, uh, a vagrant virtual machine, and the vagrant virtual machine itself is managed by salt. Um, this is similar for CI. <coughs> and but if we look at production, it's slightly different because instead of looking at um, the way that it's being done on development or staging where we have a number of services that are all running on a single box, in production, we lean on AWS pretty heavily. So instead of doing something like Kubernetes where um, we have a large scale of fleets that all look exactly the same, um, we still go on the concept that a single autoscale group is a single actual service that's running a, an, an actual lift production service. That way we can scale this cluster independently of other clusters. We can deal with its security constraints separately. Um, <clears throat> but in this case, the images and containers that run on each one of these individual clusters is man uh, man uh, managed by the Docker files. And then um, the EC2 instances themselves are managed by salt for things like users and patches, et cetera. And this is the same for every individual service. And then also, um, Salt is still in this situation managing the configuration management of the host, but it's also still maintaining all of the orchestration. Um, <clears throat> so what we actually want is to not deal with Docker files again. Like, Docker files are terrible. They're just bash. We're moving back from running um, configuration management through a sane system to running a bunch of bash scripts. And for things that are really complex, this is a massive pain in the ass. You may have Docker files that are hundreds of lines long that are generating like 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 Docker layers. Um, so what we really want is something uh, like the solution uh, Flying Cloud, which, um, <laughs> Adam is, uh, is the person building that, and it's kind of awesome. So it um, will build Docker images for you using Salt. It's somewhat similar to the process that we used to run, um, except that um, it takes all of the process of running Salt and generating images, and it does it for you. It is uh, a Python service that talks using Docker Py to the Docker's uh, to the Docker's daemon, and it will run containers, run salt, exit, commit, and give you an image. Um, <clears throat> this is definitely what we see as kind of like the, the future for what we're, we're doing. It's very nice. Uh, we've also had some conversations about how to make this process really great. Um, but the general idea is instead of having Docker files, which are very specific to environments where, um, say for instance, you have a Docker file that may use Ubuntu, um, but most of your developers use Fedora or vice versa, you could have um, salt state code for, doc for generating Docker that is agnostic to whatever base image you're using. And instead, just um, similar to using formulas, can do something to where it detects which environment that it's running in and it generates it based on that. So for instance, you have a base image that's your own base image that is based on Ubuntu and you want to rebase someone else's Docker file, you can. It just has to, it just has to be abstract enough to actually work that way. Um, so thank you. Um, if anyone has any questions. Um, so the question is, do all of our instances mount the salt state repository? So in our case, um, we have two artifacts that get put into S3. There's base and there's service. And um, these are like git shahs. So um, when the pull deploy system runs, it will go through the process of downloading the artifacts and untarring them. And that contains the salt code. So you had a slide on deployment. 
how do you how do you gain confidence that something has been tested in staging and now for component or production? Is that automated? Or does some some manual engineer have to look at it and say, yeah, this is good, let's move to production? Um, the question is how we do deployment and specifically um, how do we ensure that when people have gone through the process of deploying to a specific environment that um, that it's valid. So, um, and, one, and, and one part of it, um, when someone deploys the staging, they either get uh, a green or a red, and that comes through um, the Jenkins looking at the discovery system to see, like, has every node checked in? Is it running the correct SHA? And it will only, um, the nodes will only say they're running the correct SHA if the deployment was successful on their system. So that's one part of it, that we at least know the deployment succeeded there. And in the other case, they're supposed to be um, looking at graphs and logs to ensure that there's no errors. And in those cases, we also have alarms that are, that are uh, set up based on those. So if they've ignored the graphs and they've ignored the logs, then they're gonna get paged later. Um, and similar when they go to the canary, um, they're supposed to be looking at the logs and the graphs that are specific to Canary to ensure that uh, live traffic coming in isn't having failures. And then when they go into production, the same thing. So a deployment may take um, 30 minutes for a developer to do, um, but that's not because it takes 30 minutes to do a deployment. It's that we want, we want to put more um, burden on the developer to ensure that the code is running correctly than we do for the code to go out fast. So um, we like to deploy a lot in a single day, but we prefer things to be correct when they go out. Uh, yeah. um, for your secret management, you alluded that you wrote an external code for it. Is that right? Um, yeah, so the question is, uh, for a secret management system, I, allu I alluded that we wrote an external pillar. Uh, is that correct? Um, yes. We haven't actually released it. Um, the, in, in our case, our external pillar is a little weird. Um, most likely what we're gonna do is write an SDB um, ex, uh, module instead of a, an external pillar because it works more correctly for masters and minions um, than an external pillar where I think it will actually work in both master minion and uh, masterless modes. So um, for that, we're waiting on the next release of our secret management system which will have uh, a proper client uh, that's much easier to interact with instead of implementing uh, the client behavior in both places. And then one follow-up is how do your minions authenticate to that secret management system? Um, the question is how do our minions authenticate to the secret management system? Uh, since we're completely in AWS, um, one of the tenants behind the secret management system is that it solves the chicken and egg problem of an, the initial secret that's needed um, from the hosts to get their secrets. And the way that we do this is that we use Amazon as our source of trust. So um, there's a service in Amazon called KMS, a key management system, that allows you to do encryptions and decryptions, and it can be um, restricted through IM policy on how you can do encryptions and de decryptions. So basically we can use as a form of symmetric, uh, I'm sorry, asymmetric encryption that allows us to generate authentication tokens using that. So each one of the individual minions will generate an authentication token itself using KMS, and it'll pass that to Confidant. Confidant will decrypt that to validate that it came from, um, from an autoscaling group or an IAM rule, really, that it trusts. Um, this is, and, and I would really like to have the same form of authentication in salt and master minion mode, because that would solve a lot of problems in, uh, in AWS for salt. Unfortunately, that part of the system is not pluggable. So, Adam? Uh, you mentioned the, 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 uh, the services that are tagged with SHA, basically. Are all the artifacts in the same service tagged with the same SHA, or are they different? Um, the question is, um, we tag SHAs for artifact releases for a, for a service in all environments. Are they the same SHA? And yes, they are. So um, when, when we release the SHA to an environment, we build the SHA originally from an earlier stage in the deployment process that automatically occurs. And then when you go to staging, all it's really doing is changing the reference to the SHA and running orchestration. And then when it goes to the next one, changing the reference. And the idea is that when the code goes to the system, since we're using grains and we're using pillars, 
um, and the pillars are differentiated by grain. Some of the grains include things like the service instance, which is the environment. So it knows on the host how it's supposed to configure itself based on that. So, so then, like a service might be made about like, several different Docker images, and they would all be tagged in the same chunk. Um, the question is, a service may have a number of different images, but they do they still get tagged with the same shot? So uh, no. So in the case where you have um, where you have the service and then you have base, um, they have different shots because they're actually different services. They're they're deployed out to the same system, but they're treated as different artifacts. Um, and in the case where we're starting to split things out into thin containers, it's go 